I was just sitting in this state of despair, drinking a lot now. Now my drinking had gone to epic proportions out of that despair. Reading that Jeremiah 29 left, for I know the plans I have for you, um, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. That was laughable at that moment. Hey, what's up? Hello. And it is awesome to be here. We are the Pantry Podcast. Yes, yes. Jesus, not junk food. And today we have something we, you know, surprisingly in all of those seasons and all of these episodes, we've made it this far without talking about it pretty much ever. Right. It might have gotten touched on by someone in their story, but. Yeah. But I mean, and we've talked about addictions. We've talked about other things, but this is that one topic that I think is more common. Right. Alcohol. Right. That's very true. That's very true. You know, it's, it's very socially acceptable. So we wanted to bring someone who has been through this tunnel and come out the other side. Her name is Rose Ann Forte, and she is the founder of the Plans He Has For Me ministry, and he, she's also the author of a recently launched daily devotional by the same name that challenges people to put alcohol to the side for 12 weeks. So welcome, Rose Ann. It's awesome to yeah, have you. Yeah, welcome. So I'm so excited to talk about this today with you guys. I mean, I think the first thing is you have a challenge for people to give up alcohol for 12 weeks. Um, and the reason you even went into that is because you have given up alcohol for a lot longer than that. But there's a story behind that. So can you kind of give our listeners a little bit of that story so they can get an idea of what you've come through? It was normal. It was thing, the thing to do. And none of us starts drinking and then thinks we're going to be trapped um, right. to the level that I was trapped and um and I ultimately got to a very dark place even as a leader um in the church I used to teach bible studies be a bible study leader speak and uh, I was a treasurer of the church I was a leader in a ministry for the sick and dying I mean I love Jesus and I was still secretly suffering getting trapped um with this and uh, I ultimately conquered it in a secular program, believe it or not, um, just putting it to the side for three months. And I would, and what they were teaching was all biblical wisdom. And I'm like, why didn't I understand this? <laughs> Somebody has to document this. So this is my attempt to document what I learned, um, you know, the biblical steps and wisdom of God in um, walking a path to free yourself from the psychological slavery that I call it of this habit. You're, you're in church, you're going, th you know, you're part of church, you're, you're in group. It, it, it made me think of like how people are always like, we gotta be fruit inspectors, right? And it's like, okay, so hold on a second. If somebody was inspecting your fruit at that moment, they would have never even caught on. Mm. And, and so, and so like, it's amazing for me just sit here and be like, okay, hold on for all you people who sit out and say, I don't see no fruit or I don't see it working the way that it's supposed to be working. Well, let me tell you something. I think that Jesus is constantly at work because we can see it at two sides. We can see someone who's walking perfectly and say, oh, wow, they got it all together. And then on the other side of that, there, there's a, there's a, there's a struggle that's going on. And what you're talking about right there, that devouring, uh, makes me think of how the enemy lies in wait, ready to devour. It's not something that's just bitten off a little bit at a time. That's one of the problems I think that we see in society that has engulfed people. These are th these are people who have Christ in their life, right. who have the Holy Spirit doing work in their life. It might not it might look good, it might look bad, but I want people to understand that we can't be that person that sits there and says, "Hold on a second, they don't have Jesus," or "Wow, they have Jesus." We have to sit there and let the spirit discern and let us walk because I think that's important. That's an interesting topic. And that's one of the days in the devotional um, talking about, you know, when we accept the Holy Spirit, we have this light. But there's, um, and, and forgive me if I can't, like on the tip of my tongue, but we don't want to take the light and hide it under a basket for nobody mm. to see. And <clears throat> although I was serving Christ and I think serving him effectively, there was this darkness in me and the shame in me. I think that I had a little basket <laughs> over the light that was possible. Mm -hmm. 
when we go to church and we receive God, we have, and, and a lot of the preaching focuses on this too, is this, there's this expectation of instant renewal and I should be, and I should be, and that's what I was beating myself up for. Mm. Wait, I love you, God. Wait, I'm renewed, God. Wait, I'm this God. <laughs> like, what, What's wrong with me? Why can't I solve this? And I think that, and I think this is what the devotional helps people do too. We need to focus on like, yeah, that's okay. But just like you said, she, Satan is walking around and roaming around the earth. His number one job is to put the basket over the light. <laughs> mm, right. And, um, and we need to spend maybe more time on the mechanisms and the truth and how we defeat it, um, you know, and the, and the steps. And that's what I'm trying to say is, look, you have that light and the enemy's after you because of it. Yeah. Yeah, and like here's because... some steps that, uh, that you can walk to, you know, defeat him. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, li I like that taking steps just real quick and then I'll let you chime. But on that Philippians 1 6, mm -hmm. it's my, it's like one of my favorite verses lately because it, it talks about, you know, that Christ is, it, is doing a good work in us. Like it's not like he's done a good work, it's a, he's doing a good work mm -hmm. and it's continuing until we're our glorified bodies. And that's exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I think that some people sit there and beat themselves down and end up in that shame, end up in that darkness. And then what does that do? It gives him an opportunity to pull them in deeper. Mm. And, and shut off that light yeah and you mentioned the steps that help you get out and that's a focus especially for those listening that know someone or are someone mm. that they want to get out they want to get out of this whether it be alcohol reliance or whether it be another type of addiction but they want out but then there's this other side of the coin that's so important because we don't always focus and figure out the steps that led us there and knowing the steps that lead there, w then when you're walking in those steps, you can kind of realize and say, I'm on a dangerous path. Mm. There's, there's, there's off ramps right. because I know what path I'm on versus being completely blindsided. And I know we've had a chat with you before and we found out your, you know, the full story. And can you go a little deeper into the steps that led you? Because like you said, it wasn't this bam, I'm, I'm drinking every day and can't live without alcohol. It didn't start that way. It started in a way that feels very harmless. So can you, can you lead us through the steps yeah. that led you to that? <laughs> yeah. I was like, my mind is going crazy as I listen to you because it's, I was picking and choosing <clears throat> which, which rules I wanted to pay attention to not rules. What I say is loving guidance. That's what's all over the devotional, right? The loving yeah. guidance, wait, God told me that not because he wants me not to have fun, but because he cares about me. He loves me mm. and he doesn't want to see me run into the brick wall that I ended up running into. You know, I started drinking at a young age before I was even a Christian, 13. <laughs> That's pretty young, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, when you're younger, you, you drink to fit in that was high school like you're out where's my tribe and i want to fit in with the tribe that drank then i was in college and it was you know i i didn't know there was a not drinking crowd i literally didn't see it or know where it was and so i drank to have fun <clears throat> and then i entered I entered the working for the workforce and i climbed up the corporate ladder and there was Monday night football, Friday night happy hour, business lunches, conferences, dinners. Right. It was always there. And I got married. I, I still wasn't a Christian. But drinking and partying were a big part of our relationship. Um, it ended up being a very difficult marriage. Um, not surprisingly, we were equally yoked without God, unfortunately. So I'm all in on that equally yoked thing <laughs> makes a big difference. Um, <clears throat> but I became a Christian um, 
because of my marriage problems, I, I ended up giving my life to Christ at 32. I was pregnant with my second child and separated. I mean, that was a pretty dark time in my life. And I just grew in Christ, but I ended up spending one foot in loving Christ and one foot out trying to get the approval of my then husband. And that's just not, <laughs> not a very good way to live because... I paid the price. I paid the price of picking and choosing. You know, you said that you were super plugged in. You were definitely serving. You definitely loved, loved the Lord. But did you have a community around you of believers that were friends or even just acquaintances, anyone that you felt like you could confide any of this in? Or were you kind of serving with a facade and suffering in silence? Well, that is such a good question. <laughs> because my drinking pattern took place over decades, right? It's not, yeah. sometimes it can happen over years, especially if you're predisposed to it with, you know, parents or stuff, but mm. mine took decades. So if I think about the years that I spent as a mother and a, a church leader, I had a um, Bible study group of female friends and we all drank together. We all drank together. It wasn't recognized as something that was bad. I think over the years, we were, me and my friends were recognizing that I was recognizing that me and my Christian friends were drinking a lot and that we, you know what I mean? Outside of the church, we had our parties with alcohol. Then I moved, that was in California. Then I moved to Arizona. <clears throat> And I started with a new church. That's where I was treasurer and Bible study leader. And that's when it just became a secret. I didn't have the Christian friends that drank. Mm -hmm. It just became a secret. I'd go to Bible study, I'd go home and I'd pour myself a glass of wine, mm -hmm. you know, because it had been a habit. And so it's a progression of lots of things. I, I see God working. I see God. Okay. In California, you were implanted in this group of people. Amen. That, that, right. Right. <laughs> and, and it's like, uh, and then all of a sudden, I don't know, job transfer, whatever it was that drove you away from California. Now you have a new beginning mm -hmm. and, and, and watch a new beginning, even though you were still where he needed to meet you, where, where rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and, and, and it's cool. It's kind of cool. I'm just seeing that. It's kind of like awesome to see that he moved you. Now you're in a new church. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I like that because it's good. Yeah. This is good. No, I mean, you're right. And and the scripture comes to mind that God uses, you know, everything for good and his purpose. And that move was the beginning of the end of the destruction of our marriage mm. where we both woke up and we, we were together and we weren't getting along and we had, didn't have kids. We were kind of retired and, you know, it was the end of the marriage. And that drove me even deeper into darkness because I had prayed for this marriage for so long. And I was angry at God for unanswered prayers. I was angry at myself for staying in the marriage. 29 years, by the way, that was a long marriage. Yeah. 29 years of, you know, um, I was mad at myself for maybe like, was I supposed to stay in? Did I was mad at God? I was mad at him. I was just super dark. Like, yeah. My pastor, you know, I was a treasurer and he reflects on it. And he's like, you know, Roseanne, if we were any other church, we probably would have definitely asked you to step down. <laughs> <laughs> I was mad. I was super mad. I just, you know, my whole world was crashing down. And that's where the name of my book comes from, Jeremiah 29, 11. Mm. I was just sitting in this state of despair, drinking a lot now. Now my drinking had gone to epic proportions out of that despair. Reading that Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, um, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. That was laughable at that moment mm. in my life. And yet, I trusted him. And I, I just trusted him. And I put one foot in front of the other, and I trusted him. And I read his word to find, like, what didn't I understand? What did I do wrong? What did I... 
What did I not pay attention to? Well, the obvious thing was there, but I wasn't dealing with that right then. <laughs> Knowing that when we abide in his word, there will be a better plan. I mean, I am here to go from a depth of despair to where I had wanted, I had wanted to die. I just, I wouldn't have taken that into my own hands, but I definitely prayed, God, I'm ready. I'm done everything for you. I love you. I'm ready. You know, I had faith that I didn't doubt where I was going. If I, if you hit, if I get hit by the proverbial bus, I'm good. You know? right. Mm -hmm. right and um but that wasn't his plan was it <laughs> yeah it does seem like when you think about addictions it's not necessarily that one thing is more addictive across the board than somebody else but instead that we at our worst state we rely on the thing that gives us personally that relief that thing we remember that has given us relief or helped us feel good before. So if it's porn, it's porn. Even if you feel immediate shame after you had that that spike. If it's alcohol, then that's what it is. Even if you wake up with a hangover and you don't have the money to keep up with it. If it's drugs, if it's women, if it's men, if it's shopping, if it's food, whatever it is, it's the thing that brings you comfort that's accessible. You it's know, binge in, in watching on things. Netflix. I'm exactly. sorry. Exactly. <laughs> it's anything. It's anything that helps you escape the feeling. But but yeah. what's funny about that is is the reverse of that, right? It, it, escape is tempor is temporary. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you hit that low, that hangover, that you're hungry, you're or you're overweight, you're you, you look you 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 sit there and realize I've been watching Netflix for 48 hours, and, yeah. and it's like <sighs> the shame. So mm -hmm. then, so, so I'm going to carry this because I want to, I want to get into this 12 consecutive week thing Yeah. because that is where you, 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 the change occurred, correct? So, so yeah. tell us a little bit about that 12 week challenge. I want to <clears> call it. And that's where I'm going to just preface and uh, piggyback on what you just said. This is about what I say, habitual sin. And, mm -hmm. and okay. when I describe sin, it's that anything that takes you away from giving your time, talent, or treasures to God. Mm. Right. And, That's good. and I, I'm really trying to get rid of the stigma around alcohol, because if we are honest, we all have something that we use and, and alcohol seems to carry this big stigma when somebody else is hiding something different in the background. Right. Right. But <clears throat> I, I call it a neurological habit. I'm trying to get rid of all the languaging, alcoholic recovery, sober addiction. Um, sometimes I can't avoid it because <laughs> those are the words that we use and know. But the reality is that God created an energy efficient brain that remembers things that we tell it to do so we don't have to relearn it every single time we do it. And the best example is driving the car to and from work. And eventually we do it so we don't have to think about it, right? That's what's happening. There is a substance part and there is the, you know, the dopamine hit. But once you get rid of the substance aspect of this or cigarettes or gambling or, you know, Netflix or looking at your phone or whatever it is, cigarettes. Um, once you get rid of and you normalize your body for the dopamine effect, now you're dealing with a neurological habit. You're dealing with the tape recorder going, oh, I'm stressed. This is what I do. Oh, I need to have fun. This is what I do. And the science behind how to change a habit is it takes between like 60 some odd days to 200 days to change a habit. And so the 12 weeks is because even for me, when I joined the secular program, it was three months. When you're in the midst of something that you think is the complete joy and necessary of your life, you cannot imagine forever. It's nearly, I used to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> I knew I had to quit because it was killing me. But the only way I could do it was tell myself that like, when you're old enough and all your friends die, you can smoke again. Like, right. I hate to tell you, but this is how your mind works when you're in a substance. You just don't think it's possible. So I want to challenge people 
to do it for long enough to feel the full effect of what God's plan is. Mm -hmm. Because at first, then first they need to get their body into homeostasis. And that takes a little bit of time, two weeks. Like I have somebody in the coaching program, 17 days. She's like, I feel great. And, um, you know, it can take up to a month, but then people start getting a little bored. Like, oh gosh, it's getting boring. Like, oh, what am I going to do? And that's when we focus on what did God gift you with? You took out something that you perceive gives you joy and fun, but what did God give you? What talents and gifts? What have you, like, I, I say alcohol steals who you were created to be. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you've always wanted to take up painting or singing or bowling or macrame i don't know just right <laughs> it doesn't matter i you know i've had people like take up flying lessons say what have you always wanted to do let's pick that up and see how much joy can be inherently available without the substance and so then we start going oh this is fun right and then it's kind of documenting as we go as time goes by, well, wait a minute, I sleep better. I have more energy. I do have joy. I feel more connected mm -hmm. to people. I have more peace. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit. God, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and you right. need that amount of time to develop this awareness of what's possible. A lot of people pick like the dry January or sober October or even Lent but that's white knuckling it which never works you know it's just like oh i can't wait to drink in day 42 or day 41 or day 32 and you need enough time to redirect the neurological habit like there's this concept of neuroplasticity now yeah and that means we can redirect the trigger for stress or for fun or for joy or for peace and isn't that funny? Because God did say we can renew our mind. <laughs> like, yeah. Yes. No, I love Shay looked at me instantly because he knows that this is like where I nerd out because I've been saying this since I came to Christ. That was one of the first verses that clicked on such a deep level where he's saying you can renew your mind. And we were at a Bible mm -hmm. study and they were like, so what does this mean? And I, and I literally had read the book called, you know, brain plasticity or the plasticity of the brain. And I was like, I know exactly what it means, because if you reinforce the right things, mm -hmm. the things that, you know, we know because we're Christians to be true and to be good and to be right, then you are building these highways, these brand new highways that are going to prove to be better than the old ones that seem so big and insurmountable so that those start fading away. And those schemas in your brain start to dissolve and new schemas are developed. And so I was so excited that you mentioned that because that's the other side of the coin where we were talking about what leads you here. And it's the thing that brings you pleasure that you go to when you're in a difficult situation, which is a good warning slash nugget well, of advice for, for the believer listening. For so many, we believe that connection to others comes with alcohol. Because that's what our right. society is telling you. It's right. everywhere, right. everywhere, without incidents. But if we, and that's what we do, like if we develop the awareness, is it connection? It's disconnection because we feel like we need the substance to create the connection. Mm -hmm. Yet I feel most connected when I'm in a Bible study with people and I'm talking <laughs> about God's word, right? That's connection. Yeah. There's this true connection we have with people and and people that develop this awareness in the in the coaching that like, wait, I'm closer to my spouse or I'm closer to my children. I'm listening to what they say. I care more. They care they see me differently it's mm -hmm. it's so uplifting um but unless we practice experience develop the awareness we miss it we miss it and yet god told us this all along you know to yeah to spend time with one another to sharpen one another to hold each other accountable um yeah 
I, I, as I'm sitting here listening to, to both of you, it's like it's for some people this might be just like uh, I'm having a hard time grasping this mm -hmm. because we still have those those things that that come and try to you know snatch us away from our walk, and and that's really what it boils down to. It's like okay, it's a distraction, um, and 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 look, I'm I'm gonna say this up front too. You might walk into a church from hearing this tomorrow, and it might be the first time you walk into church, and don't expect immediacy. Mm. Um, I think that sometimes, see, we, we're so used to, especially as, uh, I'm going to use the word because it's a use a word that, that I, can, I can use because people understand it, but the person who has those addictive personalities, if you're trying to come out of it, you're looking for immediacy. You're looking for the right now. You're looking for like, okay, I want to feel good now. I want to stay feeling good. This God was promised to me. My, my mind's supposed to be transformed and conformed. And, and man, it's supposed to be good. And then, like you said, you hit that low. It's like, what do you do now? And, and what we learn is we turn in. And, and I think where we roll, run into this and where this can help people is I think you, you've you always said this too because it's you're always thinking of these the, the brain and restructuring the brain and, and rewiring it, rewiring the brain, right? And um, one of the things that we started doing as a family, like, you know, we go out and we share with people, we share the word of God. Um, we're always like doing this. And we used to say like, I believe in Jesus. You know, I believe, I believe he's king. I believe he's, he's my, my higher priest. I believe, but we changed our verbiage to claim it. He is my higher priest. He is my king. He is my Lord. Where am I going with this, right? <laughs> what I'm going at here is this is real, though. The world has given us false walls, mm -hmm. false ideas, false feelings, false emotions, false everything. And we're trying to restructure our mind like you're talking about. Get that, get that dopamine worked out in a different way. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you all something. I still get the, that feeling like you were talking about Bible studies now, <laughs> like yeah. huh, being around the body of Christ, huh, yeah. singing. I love to sing. Huh. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's not like I've, maybe I have replaced it. Yeah. I have replaced it, but I've replaced it with something that's healthy. Something that doesn't, it, it never crashes me mm -hmm. because I always know there's solidity in that, in that belief mm -hmm. or in that truth. And so as I'm sitting here thinking and listening to this, it's like uh, for the person who's sitting there saying, ah, I want this. Just know something. It's not the easiest thing. And it takes time. Right. And, it, and, it's, and it's not immediate because we're rewiring. How long was it, ma'am? Like, right. like how, how many years was it that you were wired in a different way? And then a decades. rewiring. I'm not, decades. Yeah. Decades. and I'm not saying God can't do it immediately, but he doesn't do it immediate for some people. Right. Well, I like to say, you know, we are, we are wired to move towards pleasure and away from pain. Uh, but when we have habitual sin, um, we start understanding that we want to be one way and we're having a difficult time. So one, mm -hmm. yeah, don't bully yourself. And, and God, he has new mercies every morning, right? It's it's okay. Amen. This is the Amen. process. Um, but I like to teach people, if it feels uncomfortable, that's when you know you're doing your job. You're renewing your mind because your natural tendency is to go to where you were going and it's super uncomfortable to change that habit. <laughs> you know, just think about something more simple like, oh, I used to get up at six and now I want to get up at five. That is not necessarily comfortable when you first start it. But then you do it over and over and over again and you start popping out of bed early. Or the, the gym habit is a perfect example. Like how fun is it to start the gym at the beginning? <laughs> super uncomfortable but you do it over and over and over again and you get that high and you look forward to it and you you know you, you know how important it is and so I start saying oh that's uncomfortable lean in because that's exactly what you're doing you're being successful and people look at the discomfort as a failure 
And it's not, it's the fact that you're doing something that's changing something in the direction that you want to go. Because for some of people listening, this might be like describing yellow to a blind person. You know, like they cannot fathom, what do you mean Bible study is more fun? What do you mean sitting around talking about a book, even if it is the Bible, even if they are a believer, what do you mean sitting around talking about the Bible is more interesting and more fun and more fulfilling than going out with the music blaring and the night's alive and there's lights and there's people and you're meeting new people. How is that more entertaining? And yet it is because in one setting, I mean, all the friends I had that I went, I went to the bar two, three times a week with, they're all gone from my life. They're alive, (laughs) but they're all, they like, but they faded. They fade. Like the connection wasn't really, established like that it was all reliant on this drink whereas now i have people who they there's no one thing that is required every time we get together and they see me for me and accept me Mm. it's not the grandstanding me hiding behind a bottle that they're seeing thank you yeah and i think every listener can maybe relate to this because it doesn't matter what what place in society you are If you look at society, we are society of searchers for meaning. And we search in fake filters on our camera and alcohol and bars and wealth. I used to work for one of the richest people in the world. And when he had sold his company, he looked at me and he said, now what? as if his life was empty and I'm looking at like billions of dollars thinking, did you just say that to me? Mm. Um, It's not, it's just, you can climb the ladder of wealth and there will always be more wealth and it will never satisfy the desire of what you're looking for. (laughs) And um, you can go to a bar every Monday through Sunday. There's a bar to welcome you and give you a smile and offer you the beer and all the beautiful music, but you will leave there every single night empty, right? If you focus your time on social media and what everybody's trying to say, you will always think you're not good enough. <laughs> it's, right. Hopefully everybody can relate to that, that right. what is out there now is a bunch of people searching for their place, never really finding it. That's right. how I Self, see it. Self-driven, not selfless driven. Right. Yeah. It's, it's amazing when we lived and, in that. Yeah, go ahead. No, and, the, and that gift part, you know, that God-given gift part, finding what you were created to be. So many people are in fear. Like, I know, I, I think I can sing, but I don't want to because I don't want to be just judged is just go for it this was something you believe god gave you be fearless and pursue it because that's probably where you're going to find joy and then i tell people like it doesn't matter what you like or what you're finding joy in go to your church and go hey you know what i really like flower decorating can you use me or i really like bowling you know Mm -hmm. can you use me anywhere i can you think of a church that that would say no to any gift right that they right. found joy in you know and i think with that <clears throat> when you're using your gift in service to help others it's this feeling of joy inside that cannot be mm. replicated right so we've talked about what led you there and the process that led you out, but the one big portion is what caused you to make that transition at all? So what was that impetus that moved you from I'm trapped in mental slavery to Mm. I'm going to do the work to get out? What was that, that big defining moment? I think I'm probably typical of many people. There's this awareness of there is a problem there's the mental gymnastics of trying to put all these conditions around solving the problem on your own secretly beating yourself up um and the unfortunate well 
I think developing that awareness of this is a problem. Look at my, for me, it was look at my weight, look at my mental health, look at my um, relationships. My, my relationships were just dwindling or the ones I had, I wasn't happy with because they were bar related. And, um, but my world was closing in. I was spending more and more time in the house, in the darkness and secret. And um, so building up the awareness of what it's cost you, but there was an event. And unfortunately it's always an event that will snap you out and you go, okay, you know, and the event could be a bad hangover. You said something, you did something, a, a relationship, a car accident, a DUI, you know, unfortunately they're bad. And, and I'm no different. My event was COVID drinking suppresses the immune system and it, it suppresses the lung function two of which things you super need. So that was the impetus for me to do something. And it will be an, I just had a conversation with a client, um, yesterday and because i send out these emails like you know here are the nine things that it's alcohol awareness month here are the nine things that you may consider being aware like is alcohol controlling you are you controlling it and <clears throat> one of the things on there was has somebody that cares about you expressed their concern over your drinking levels and she basically got in touch with me and she goes, my sister just told me I was a trigger for her. And that was mm -hmm. the impetus for her, like the horrific thing for her that said, okay, I got to stop. You know, there's always something, unfortunately, but not to beat yourself up, just keep being aware of what the cost is and the something will come up, even if it's somebody you love saying look this is kind of getting to be a problem and that could be the impetus to changing it that's good it's been good yeah it's been, i think we gave a lot because and i think what it what as we're wrapping this up what what really strikes me and i think what people need to hear is that jesus brings a light mm -hmm. and and no matter how dark it might feel right he brings this light and it actually made me think of this little light of mine I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, right? Mm -hmm. Let it shine. Whatever whatever that you can manage at that moment, let his light shine. And it gets brighter, and it gets brighter, and it gets brighter until all of a sudden there's this radiance. Every single word every single scripture we read every single moment spent in kindness to someone else it matters and you know it shows light and there is so much as you said it's it's a process it's a journey it shines yeah. brighter and brighter he he takes us right where we are and just as growing in relationship with him we just keep getting you know better and better at shining our light you know so has it been three three years since the impetus? Mm -hmm. How's your light? Oh How's my your gosh! Light? <laughs> How's your light? <laughs> you know, one thing I used to say about myself, and this is kind of gets into your that mindset thing, Michelle, that you talk about. I used to think I was a good Bible teacher and I was good servant of Christ, and I would serve in the background and stuff like that, but. Oh, I am, I am not an evangelist. Uh-uh, not an evangelist. God didn't give me that gift. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I'm not, as good as I was in the church. I'm, I don't know. Maybe I brought people to Christ. Maybe I didn't. You don't know. But now it's like, it's shocking to me after telling myself <laughs> that I'm not an evangelist, <laughs> that one of the things that I wasn't prepared for in my coaching, I'm like an alcohol-free coach. I did not expect the amount of people to come to the program and go, I've kind of never opened a Bible and I don't know God, but I think I'm ready to learn. <laughs> like, okay, That's well, right. let's get wow. into it, you know, and uh, here we are, Roseanne the Evangelist. <laughs> 
There wow, you go. Fire. Praise God. Fire. Praise God. Yes. Anyways, thank you so much yes, for just so having much. this conversation with us. Uh, thank um, you. I think at, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's it's important. It's important for people to understand that there is a better way. Yeah. And yeah. that's and that's through Jesus Christ. And 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 we abide and we love and we obey because it's not. <laughs> It's, it's not something that's weighing me down. It's because he's done so much to, to, to release me. Yeah, it's yeah, because he wants ahead. us to live this full life of peace and joy and connection. And oh, it's it's indescribable. And, um, and it's Amen. available for every single one of us. Amen. Amen. And everybody listening, you can definitely connect with Roseanne at theplanshehasforme.com. And you can also get her devotional there, connect with her for coaching, or just shoot her a question. So thank yeah. you, Roseanne, for, for coming on, bearing your whole story, you know, so people can see and relate to all of it. Remember, everyone, you can also go to thepantrypodcast.com to download our seven-day Jesus Not Junk Food devotional and support us at patreon.com slash thepantrypodcast. So until next time. Bye. Bye.